Good day, good evening, good people, wherever you're joining us from in the world. It is truly our honor and privilege to be giving this keynote address as part of the Plural Positivity World Conference. Just the fact that such a conference exists makes us so happy. <sighs> so hoping you could take a breath with us if that feels comfortable and available for you. <sighs> and you can close your eyes or leave them open and on these exhales, perhaps making a sound of letting go. <sighs> so by way of introduction, professionally, we are Dr. Jamie Marich. We're known as an EMDR therapy trainer, the author of three books on EMDR therapy, the author of Dissociation Made Simple, and many other books in the field of trauma recovery and expressive arts. Although on a very personal note, and for us most importantly, we are Jamie Plus. We're a dissociative system who has been very out and proud since 2018. And we had an evolution in our coming out process, which we'll be speaking to a little bit more during this address, that was really many years coming, especially as a professional who acquired our diagnosis of what at the time was DDNOS, Dissociative Disorder NOS, for the first time in 20, 2004, not even 20, 2004, when we were a graduate student. So since it is really our intention to speak to you on shame from this place of Jamie's perspective. Yes, Jamie knows how to present as Dr. Jamie when she has to. Uh, I would like to say we co-front, even though we're essentially the same part that shares the driver's seat of our dissociative system. And we use the metaphor of the van or the bus to really describe how our system works. Yet, especially in a talk like this, which really celebrates plural positivity, we truly want to speak to you as Jamie. So I think it might be more appropriate if we take off the professional blazer because <laughs> we often wear things like this at academic conferences to, um, you know, set that tone of credibility. And yes, we like to wear blazers in colors like hot pink and we still need leave our nose rings in yet, particularly when we know we're amongst friends. <sighs> it's just so much easier to be ourselves. And we're very grateful that in recent years, even when we're not so much amongst friends, we've been venturing more fully into this world of, of being our ourselves. So the topic of my keynote is really on being out and proud and addressing shame. And this word shame has really activated a lot of us who identify as dissociative systems lately particularly in the wake of Dr. Matthew Robinson's presentation, the Grand Rounds at McLean Hospital, and some of the other content that is really chiding social media and self-diagnosis that has been put out there in more professional circles. And this word shame has come up a lot from these professionals speaking on our behalf that, well, people with DID and people with dissociative systems and people with OSDD1, which is how we particularly identify, are usually shrouded in shame. And so this notion of what it means to really be out and proud is baffling for a lot of professionals who study us. And part of me has to wonder if many of the clients that they have seen have not felt comfortable in their presence showing the full glory and colors of their system. Because in our experience, particularly when we first got diagnosed and when we got diagnosed in 2004, it was like our world suddenly made sense to us. The, the diagnosis helped us frame our world in a way that made sense. But we knew, particularly as a young professional, that if we were really going to make it, we had to hold it together. And it's only in recent years. And I've sometimes wondered if that's because we've established ourselves with more credibility, that we're able to be more out and proud and, and not ashamed, or if it's because our friends, especially using 
the tools of social media for the good have really broken down the barriers of shame that have existed around our diagnoses for for decades in, in the professional field. So a few other things I want to share just by way of formality. Our pronouns are she, they, we. We do vacillate, you'll hear between this talk, uh, between I and we pronouns. Uh, it's, it's interesting because we pronouns have been very natural to us since we were a child. And it wasn't until we had a major psychiatric experience again in 2016 that we noticed, wow, we're using we pronouns a lot. We should probably watch that. And even as established Jamie Marich calling herself on that, saying we should probably watch that, really showed me what I'm kind of up against in the field or what the reality of the field is, that it's it's not considered acceptable for someone to use anything but I pronouns, particularly as, as the fronting party in a dissociative system. So those are our pronouns. Uh, we're recording this talk in our home office, which is in uh, near Akron, Ohio. More importantly, that's on occupied Erie territory land, Erie Nation land. And I say that to honor the people and the healing systems that have come before us because friends, professional psychology, professional psychiatrists, I say this as a professional clinical counselor, we're really doing nothing new here to help people heal, to help people tap into what they've known about the innate wisdom of their systems all along. Although professional psychology has had its place, it's not the be all and end all. And if you're feeling particularly ashamed because of how psychologists or psychiatrists have made you feel over the years, we get it. And we say that from a place of tremendous privilege. As a white woman, we are bisexual, yet we do have all of the opportunities of white privilege. We've traditionally been able to access the best health care. We've been formally diagnosed. And we know that's a privilege in North America. So even with all of those privileges, we still know what it's like to be misunderstood by professionals and by our fellow professional colleagues. By all intents and purposes, we've made it in that we're established. We have a PhD. We've written books. And we still feel more at home in communities like the Plural Association, like with our friends and family of plurals on Twitter and on TikTok than we really ever have in professional organizations. So Jamie Plus, Jamie, Dr. Jamie, who's driving the bus, four, nine, and 19, we all see you and we honor you. So let's unpack shame a little bit. Mentioned that I got my diagnosis in graduate school. I finished with my master's in counseling in 2005, and it was a very tricky time for me in that we were actively dissociating through much of our graduate school experience. Largely because we felt ourselves being triggered or activated so much. And our graduate internship, ex internship experience was in an adolescent mental health unit. And on that unit, it was not the children, but it was the way we saw children being treated that really activated our system and caused us to kind of go blank, like you just saw me do a minute ago and not really know how to proceed. And I was fortunate to have a colleague who knew what he saw and said, Jamie, this is a lot of dissociation. And if you do not get this addressed, you're not going to last very long in this field. And so in his wisdom, he recommended that I talk to a graduate professor who recommended a therapist that was very well trained in dissociation 
in EMDR therapy, and that was when I formally received my diagnosis in 2004. Something else very important happened to me in 2004. I should also mention, we should also mention, uh, we're a person in long-term recovery from an addictive disorder. Uh, we've been continuously sober from drugs and alcohol since 2002. And as what happens, this happens a lot with, with people who get chemically sober, uh, that was our dissociation for so many years. The dissociation we became very accustomed to as children once we met chemicals, once we met drugs and alcohol, it really accelerated our natural tendency to dissociate. And then once we got our initial recovery and stopped using drugs and alcohol, we were dissociating very, very significantly in the ways I just described. So my therapist who I was sent to knew this. She she knew this pattern and, and accurately identified what was going on. And we began a course of trauma-focused treatment to really help us address living life as a system and healing from the trauma. During that same year, 2004, we were very fortunate to have a graduate professor named Jerry Carter. He was the director of the main drug and alcohol clinic in Youngstown, Ohio, where we're from. And we had the good fortune of taking his graduate class in substance use disorder and addiction counseling. And one night during class, he read a poem to us called My Name is Shame. My Name is Shame. I want to share with you a little bit of that poem here at the beginning. And then I'll revisit it a little bit later towards the end of my talk. Because hearing Jerry read this poem was so vital to my recovery. It felt like for the first time, somebody really understood us and understood the role that shame played in our development. And I decided in preparing this keynote that we wanted to share this piece with you because there has been so much talk in our community lately about the role that shame plays in dissociative disorder diagnoses and dissociative expressions and trauma-based disorders. So I really want to use this poem, which was originally written by John Bradshaw and Reverend Leo Booth, the late John Bradshaw and uh, Reverend Leo Booth, who are two addiction counselors themselves. And uh, this is where I really started to dive deeply into exploring and healing my own shame, which comes from the trauma I've learned, not from having a diagnosis. I came upon you when you were young, when you were very young, before you understood, before you could speak, before you realized I was there, I came upon you. I created feelings of unworthiness, disgust, inferiority, ugliness, stupidity, poverty, and difference, I tarnished the image of God. I existed before the guilt, I live before the action, I was the whisper before the sound. Always I enter through the back door, unseen, unwanted, the first to arrive. Guilt grows in me. Guilt finds its strength alongside me. I mold guilt into shape. My name is shame. The world asks, where does shame come from? From anywhere and everywhere the condescending glance from a parent, the awkward appearance in the mirror, the cruel remark from children, the touch that does not feel right. 
I come from anywhere and everywhere. I bring the pain that does not go away. Shame. My name is shame and I live in negativity. I make you feel dirty, guilty, less than, inferior. I take what you are, what you have, how you look, and abuse you with it. So notice what's coming up for you now. There were a lot of powerful, strong words that I shared there. If you need to connect with something that works for you very well for grounding and anchoring, please do that. If you need to take a breath, stand up, shake it out, put this on pause, get some air and come back. Those are all options. So the question I have for a lot of my fellow professionals who associate the way our minds work with shame, is it are we ashamed of the diagnosis? Or has shame been put there by the things that were done to us? And is the shame further cultivated or further enhanced when we try to explain these things to people who we just know will not get it? And for my fellow professionals, does that read for you as shame? So picking up a little bit with my story, and then I have some questions for all of us to consider, whether you're a plural system who is thinking of coming out more fully, but maybe you feel ashamed of something, and to the larger professional community who may be listening to this, whether you're a plural system or whether you're doing your best to be an ally. So I mentioned, friends, that I was diagnosed formally in 2004. My addiction recovery officially began in 2002, and I never had an ounce of shame about being out about that. Maybe because the field of addiction and substance use disorders is a place that more promotes people being out about lived experience and the mental health side of our field can get a little more shrouded in professionalism, hidden in professionalism. So after getting the diagnosis, I knew pretty instantly that this was not something I should broadcast to mental health colleagues even though it helped me inform my own recovery and help my world make a lot of sense. So I remember in 2006, I was at my second level EMDR training. EMDR is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's one of the top treatments for trauma and PTSD. And one of the discussions in the EMDR community has long been, is EMDR therapy safe to do with people who dissociate and dissociation specific lectures often happen at conferences. And the short answer, if you're wondering, is if the clinician doing the EMDR is not afraid of dissociation and knows how to really work with the individual or the system where they're at, EMDR can be a marvelous healing intervention. Yet a lot of the problems I've seen with EMDR therapy being done with dissociative systems is when a therapist is doing the EMDR who is also very afraid of dissociation and doesn't know how to handle what can come up. So when I went to that first advanced level two training, I went to hear the special topic speaker on dissociation. And I'm sitting there hearing her talk. This is about two years after my own diagnosis. 
And on one hand, we're thinking she is making this way more complicated than it needs to be. And on the other hand, we're like, yeah, but who are we? We're we're just somebody with the diagnosis. We're just somebody who has a lot to learn. So maybe we should just sit and listen. And we did. And our fawn response was so strong. We even went up to her after the presentation and said, thank you. Thank you for, for that, that beautiful presentation, even though we were left there with a, huh? What, 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 did, what did she just say? She turned us into a science project. She made it so complicated. And I think that's what a lot of my fellow professionals have done out of their own fear. If we can try to over-explain it, in these very complicated terms, then maybe clinicians won't be so afraid. But I find that it often makes many clinicians more afraid, even though some of these over complicated models and theories and studies are being done to satisfy the larger scientific community to prove that we exist. (laughs) Personally, I'm no longer interested in having those battles and debates about whether or not we exist. That's just where we're at today as a system. And for a lot of years, this was our experience going into professional settings, especially EMDR professional settings, feeling like our colleagues were turning us into a science project. And we proceeded with doing our EMDR work, primarily specializing in addiction. Our dissertation was on a topic connected to EMDR and addiction. And in 2011 is when I would say we first dipped our toe out in terms of being out about having dissociation. But even at that time, it was in our first book, EMDR Made Simple, I remember we wrote that we struggle with dissociation as part of our complex PTSD diagnosis. Because for a lot of us, it's safer to come out, right, with, with PTSD or complex PTSD, that even though there can be stigma towards all mental health issues, PTSD, CPTSD are still more acceptable in professional circles than saying you have a dissociative disorder. So I think the big part of what emboldened us to keep coming out more and more is feeling more confident in who we were as a person, as a system, and feeling more confident in the relevance and the material that we had to teach. And in 20, let's see, 2014, it's probably when I would say from certain presentations that we gave to EMDR therapists, to other clinicians. If the audience felt right and safe enough, we would kind of feel it out and start to mention things like, we've been treated for a dissociative disorder. In some circles, we'd say we have a dissociative disorder. And after one such talk, an individual came up to me and said, I can't believe a public presenter was that candid about having a dissociative disorder. And I couldn't tell friends if she was insulting me or in awe of me. And once we talked it out a little bit more, it was indeed that she was just shocked that somebody would be that out about it. It was also around that time that I went to my first conference in the major professional organization I won't directly name that has dissociation in the title. We were accepted to present. It was our first conference. And we thought we'd be going into our homeland where so many people would be out. It was one of the most coldest, most coldest. It was one of the coldest, most invalidating experiences ever. And we've come to find out that many plural systems have not felt welcome at such professional conferences. We felt that way as a professional who already had three books to her name in 2014. So I ventured into becoming an EMDR basic trainer. And then many of my closer friends as professionals who I was out to knew that I had a dissociative disorder. And they started asking, Jamie, when are you going to do a training on dissociation? And we knew we couldn't until we could talk about dissociation as candidly as we're talking to you now. We did not want to be one more presenter who was up there just throwing out slide after slide or speaking in code. And we've also had the spidey sense that many of these high level presenters really are systems themselves. 
but won't out themselves as such. And we didn't want to be that. But we also knew we weren't fully prepared. And the progression continued. Uh, Also in 2015, we came out publicly. And I say publicly because once more to people who really mattered, we were out. Uh, We came out as bisexual, as queer, which was hard for us as somebody who grew up in a very conservative family. We were chastised to hell again by one of our family members. It was awkward with other family members, yet we knew we had to come out to them because we were starting to be more public in our advocacy with queer folks. So I wanted them to hear it from me as opposed to Facebook or an article. Friends, that coming out was actually less difficult than in 2018 when I formally came out as a dissociative system, as someone who uses we pronouns as someone whose diagnosis has varied over the years, because once more, the original diagnosis we were given was a DSM-4 diagnosis. And even in the years since, you know, we've taken the mid, we, I should say we've subjected ourselves to the mid and it's torture. We've, we've been evaluated again to try to get a handle on what our exact diagnosis is. And um, at this point, to me, the label really doesn't matter of it. We do fall somewhere between OSD D1 and DID. I like how the ICD-11 calls it partial dissociative identity disorder instead of OSDD. We're just a system, a person with dissociative identities. We really have leaned into that identifier more than anything because we do navigate life as a system. We are we even though we don't have a lot of amnestic barriers in adulthood, even though we are co-conscious 99.9% of the time. Once more, we relate more to our brothers and sisters and fellow humans with DID than we do with other professionals, other scholars in our field. So a couple interesting things happen in 2006. You may have heard there was a major presidential election in the United States that (laughs) activated a lot of trauma survivors. And yeah, all of a sudden there was a president who was a walking reminder of my father, my my primary abuser. Uh, My marriage was crumbling. And Dr. Jamie just got exhausted from carrying the weight so much. And so we entered back into treatment and got reevaluated and got what we needed. And I would say our healing was so powerful at that point. There was no way our marriage had a chance of surviving it. And in 2017, when my ex-husband and I separated or when I asked him to leave, he threatened to use my diagnosis against me. It was a very ugly display of a self-injury episode that of mine that he got on camera against my knowledge and he put it on YouTube. And I was already pretty well established on YouTube for my EMDR content. So yeah, it was, it was jolting. It was, it was a horrible experience yet, yet we got YouTube to take it down. And when I showed the content to my main therapist, my trauma therapist, who's a dissociation specialist, and I was also working with an expressive arts therapist at the time, they both said, and this is important because this has informed my work since that time. They said, Jamie, he looks like, I'll use their words because they both used it separately. He looks like the asshole. He looks like the idiot for trying to use something that is clearly and obviously painful against you. Yeah. Even as I say that, my body's just filled with this zing of recognition that, yeah, this is his shame he's trying to put on me. This is not me. And so even now, when I know that there are professionals out there who talk behind my back or who aren't fans of what I'm doing with being out, to me, that reflects more on them. And often in these contexts, I've wanted to say, why aren't you more candid and vulnerable about your human experience? Yes, boundaries are important and you have discretion about what you share. Yet hiding behind this cloak of professional credibility And professional, we got to keep it professional, is not doing any of us any favors. 
I've said in several pieces that we have no prayer of ending stigma. And stigma is just a nice word for discrimination, as I've come to learn. We have no hope or no prayer of ending stigma in larger society until we end it in our field. And by my field, I mean not just the helping professions, but even the helping professions that are specifically designed to study trauma and dissociation. And yes, a lot of the criticism I'll get is, you know, we have to be professionally credible if the medical establishment is going to take us seriously. And I'm grateful, we're grateful to the scholars and researchers who have put the numbers behind so much of what they've investigated to give us more of that credibility. And it's still not good enough. Because in 2018, I could honestly say it felt more terrifying and harder for me to come out, for us to come out as a professional with dissociative experiences with a dissociative system. That was harder than coming out as bisexual in a conservative family. And I'd like you to take a moment and just breathe with that with me. Because that's hard. It's hard to say. So I realize it can be hard to hear. Whether you're someone who already is out or whether you're somebody who's contemplating coming out more fully. <sighs> so my friends... What's happened in my life since 2018? So my official We Are Jamie, We Are Jamie Plus happened in an article that we wrote on our blog and then it was later picked up for the mighty. Later that year, we asked to present to our meeting of EMDR trainers that happens every year at the International Conference. And overall, that was met very kindly by so many of our fellow trainers. And I said to them, I've sat in trainings over the years and have heard the way you've talked about us. And I want to offer myself up as somebody, really, you can pick our brains about what really happens with EMDR and dissociative experiences. In 2019, we told our story more fully at the EMDR International Association Conference, we started being more bold about it in our writing and other advocacy that we do. I kind of rallied the group of professionals that work with me in my company, the Institute for Creative Mindfulness. We're one of the biggest training providers of EMDR now in North America. And before I went out more fully publicly, I asked all of them, or I didn't really ask for permission. It was just, I'm giving you an alert that I'm going to be speaking more freely about the fact we're a dissociative system. So I just want all of you to be warned and be advised <laughs> that this may come back on you unkindly somehow. And I had nothing but tremendous support from my core of folks who work with me. Yet even the fact that I had to have that conversation, right, is pretty telling about where we're at in, in this field. We know there's a lot of people who don't like what we do and we don't care. You know why? <laughs> we feel better. Every level that we have come out more proudly, the less shame we have felt about using we pronouns, about using Jamie Plus on our signature line, the more we haven't tried to zip it all up and hold it together, we have felt better in our functioning, in our creative zeal for life. Still working on a lot of the relational elements of our healing, yet we are progressively healing because we are being out and authentic about who we are. And it's awesome. So I get asked all the time, do I regret coming out? Absolutely not. I also recognize it was a progression for me. It happened over time. And I recognize that with every degree of privilege I got, 
it facilitated me being able to say, I don't care with a lot more emphasis. So when writing dissociation made simple, of course, I went into researching and looking at some of the barriers that fellow professionals have about coming out, mostly fear of how they'll be seen amongst other professionals, fear of how their families might respond to them, fear that a professional licensing board or college may come after that. And as I say in Dissociation Made Simple, I encourage professionals to look at the individual laws and guidelines in their state or in their province or in their country and to even ask for a meeting. You can ask for it anonymously and ask how people with your individual diagnosis are handled. I will tell you from what I've investigated in the United States that most U.S. states, or at least the ones I know of, including my own state of Ohio, cannot formally come after taking your license unless there's direct evidence that there has been harm done to a client. And even if a client does file a report on you, it is still investigated. You're still given your due process, that your license is not under scrutiny just for having a diagnosis. And of course, different states have different laws about what you have to disclose at the time that you're licensed, which we did. Yet we also were able to show evidence of treatment and being on a path of recovery. So find out because some of the fears that you most fear might be unfounded. Yet I honor and recognize that those fears are there because of how society and how other clinical professionals treat people with dissociative disorders. And I don't have to share it with you that a lot of that treatment involves denial that our minds exist as they do. Denial of the diagnoses. It's also come to my attention that in our communities, professional and non-professional in our plural communities, there can be a lot of this, you know, shame around, well, do I qualify enough? Because my system is different than this system that's really popular and well-known out there. Or my system reads differently than how it might show in the DSM or in case books. And I've long <laughs> lived my, my life, our lives, with the direction that if you think you belong, you probably do. As we were diagnosed very early in, in our professional life, in our adult life, Yet it always very much felt like we belonged with other plural people. Same with queer folks. Even as a kid growing up conservative, we knew something was off about the way we were being raised. So to speak to the recent controversies, which to me have not been that recent because I've been hearing complaints about self-diagnosis since the whole real rise of the internet age and giving patients or clients more access to information. We've said in our teaching, we would rather see things be overdiagnosed and then discussed than underdiagnosed and missed. Have we taken it too far with the internet making people believe that they have everything? Even as a professional, I don't want to get into those debates because I know how a lot of my, uh, <laughs> this is nine coming through, our snottier colleagues will look at it. Well, if they're not analyzed, if they're not assessed, if they're not, then, then you know, they can't claim that they're the doctor and, and that they have, even as, as we say that and repeat that, it's ridiculousness. One of the smartest memes I ever saw is like doctors and psychologists will often say, don't confuse your 30 second Google search with my medical degree. And then the comeback to that is, don't confuse the 30 minute lecture you had on it in medical school with my lifetime of living with it. And I will tell you in, in my graduate training in 20, 2003 to 2005, DID was only mentioned once for a few minutes and it was very much mentioned in this vein of it's so rare you probably won't ever see it because there have only been 200 true cases of DID and I always say where did they come up with that number 200 
I think it's something they pulled out of their bottoms. So that's us. And we're going to be here continuing to speak as a plural system in professional circles. We think that what has happened in recent months and over the last year around self-diagnosis, to us, it's exciting. To us, it represents the democratization of knowledge and helping people be able to advocate for themselves and shifting these narratives around many of the mental health diagnoses being labeled as shameful things to experiences that we can have pride about. As a queer woman, I've learned what it has meant to celebrate my life with pride. And as a dissociative system, we're still learning that. And we're very grateful. So as I close, I'd like to go back to our poem. Because in this poem, we really get a lot of the answer. Shame. Created guilt. Even in the child. And yet you were never to blame. You did nothing. You did not understand and still you blamed yourself. Shame says I came upon you when you were young. When you were very young, before you understood, before you could speak, before you realized I was there, I came upon you. I reply, but I do not have to listen. Today I am beginning to see my beauty. I rejoice in my difference. I am discovering my power. I do not have to live in yesterday. I can change. I can dream. I can create a positive life, a positive world, a positive love. Oh, shame. I know where you come from. You come from within me. I created you, I give you power, I keep you alive. Only when I begin to confront the shadows, face the pain, reveal the hurt, will I be healed. Shame, I know you. You are a part of me. By loving you, I am free. And I'll just amend that for my system by saying, by loving you, we are free. So wherever you're at, I'll invite you to take an organic stretch, maybe shaking out or stomping out anything that's coming up for you or any of your parts right now that feels like it needs to be released. We will have a little question and answer and discussion. And I know some of you have been discussing throughout. Please take exquisite care of yourself. All of these keynotes will hopefully be empowering in their way, yet discuss heavy content that some of your parts may really feel activated by that some of your entire systems or landscapes might feel very triggered by. And we thank you for showing up and challenging yourself to listen. And please do what you need to help yourself continue processing or being with the content. We thank you very much for letting us speak to you today.